Hello, welcome to Tala Talks NICU. Today we're going to be talking about meconium aspiration syndrome, which is often shortened to MAS. MAS is a reversible cause of pulmonary hypertension in that the lungs have developed normally, but the meconium comes in and causes the lungs to be damaged slightly, even if it's only transiently. So today we're going to go through an introduction to MAS, what causes MAS, why does meconium make babies so sick, then we'll go through the prevention of MAS, the x-ray finding of MAS, and finally the treatment of meconium aspiration syndrome. So let's start with an introduction. What is meconium aspiration syndrome? MAS is respiratory distress in a newborn caused by the presence of meconium in the tracheobronchial airways. Meconium, as I'm sure you know, is that sticky tar-like stool substance that babies pass within the first few days of their lives. It's made up of amniotic fluid, bits of intestine, cells, bile sorts, and all the other secretions that the baby has made within the intestinal tract. If a baby is stressed in utero, and by the way, we use the word stressed in utero or in newborn babies when we're basically implying that the baby has not received enough oxygen. So if a baby is stressed in utero, then it may end up passing meconium. So you would end up with meconium stained amniotic fluid. If the baby is even more stressed, then it would start gasping, allowing that baby to start inhaling or aspirating that meconium stained amniotic fluid. Only about 2 to 10% of all the babies born through meconium stained amniotic fluid end up with any respiratory symptoms. And only about half of those end up needing some sort of mechanical ventilation. So, really, the vast majority of babies born through meconium stained amniotic fluid don't get sick at all. But, as you know, some babies can get really, really sick from it. And we'll talk about that in more detail later. Meconium is not really passed until about 34 weeks gestational age. So really, this is a disease of babies that are late preterm, term, and especially post-term. In fact, the higher the gestational age of the baby, the higher the risk of developing MAS. And most likely, it's because those really post-term babies, those 41, 42, 43 week babies, are getting maybe too large for their placenta. So they've got a much higher chance of lacking the oxygen they need or getting stressed out. So what causes meconium aspiration syndrome? Like we said, it involves the baby being stressed in utero, being stressed enough to actually pass meconium. And it has to happen when they're truly in utero. If the baby is passing meconium as it's being delivered, so terminal meconium, then obviously they're not going to be able to aspirate that and cause meconium aspiration syndrome. So again, it's not enough to just pass the meconium aspiration syndrome. The baby has to be stressed enough to be gasping to actually aspirate that meconium filled fluid and for it to get into the lungs and start doing the damage that it's going to do. The two most common ways that a baby could get stressed in utero is that there's something going on with the placenta. Like for example, there's a placenta abruption and it's being ripped off the wall of the uterus. Or there could be something wrong with the cord. So as the baby's being delivered, it keeps smashing against the cord and cutting off the blood supply. Obviously, that would cause the baby to get stressed as well. So then, why does meconium in the lungs make babies just so sick? There are basically seven mechanisms that cause babies to get so sick. The first one is where you just get obstruction of the airway. So if you get little bits of meconium, so little chunks or particulate matter of the meconium, and they travel down the bronchi and the, the trachea and the bronchi, and they can end up in the smaller airways, they can literally block off, small chunks of meconium can block off the smaller airways and cause the atelectasis, so cause the alveoli to collapse. And therefore, you're just decreasing your area for gas exchange. So the first way is just flat out obstruction of the airways. The second mechanism is the ball valve effect. So I want you to imagine a little piece of meconium, so a little chunk of meconium, traveling all the way down the airways until it pretty much reaches the alveoli. And the reason why it can do this is when somebody is inhaling all their airways, if anything, dilate a little bit. So the respiratory bronchioles, the terminal bronchioles dilate. So that little chunk of meconium has a clear path to reach the alveoli. However, when somebody exhales, 
the respiratory and terminal bronchioles, all the airways collapse a little bit. So it's not difficult to imagine that even if a meconium was able to travel all the way inside during inspiration, during expiration, it might get trapped at the level of the respiratory or the terminal bronchioles. And because of that, the air inside the alveoli can't actually leave the lungs. So the air is trapped inside the alveoli and the carbon dioxide that's in the alveoli that was thrown out from the blood vessels is also trapped within the alveoli. So this is called the ball valve effect. So the third mechanism is air leaks. So going back to the ball valve effect, you can imagine that if enough air is getting trapped within the alveoli and every time you breathe in, more and more air is going into the alveoli, but none of it can actually leave, eventually that alveoli is going to be so full that it pops. Air escapes from within the lungs and goes into the pleural space, therefore causing a pneumothorax or a pneumomediastinum maybe. Obviously, that in itself can cause severe respiratory distress. The fourth mechanism is a pneumonitis, so like a chemical inflammation, an irritation of the lungs. That's because there are plenty of substances in the meconium, especially the bile sorts, that will result in a release of the inflammatory pathway and just really irritate the tissue in the lungs. The fifth mechanism is inactivation of surfactant. So again, there are substances in the meconium, especially cholesterol and bile sorts, that will kind of change the structure of the surfactant and stop it from working. So on top of everything else, you don't even have a well-functioning surfactant in meconium aspiration syndrome. The sixth mechanism is the potential for an infection. As you probably know, meconium is sterile, or at least it should be sterile, but it has been shown that meconium provides a fantastic medium for growing bacteria. Like GBS loves the idea of growing in meconium. So especially if the mother's been ruptured or she has a fever and that itself caused the stress, you cannot rule out a superimposed infection on top of your meconium aspiration syndrome. And the seventh mechanism, if you think about it, is very obvious. What caused the baby to be stressed in the first place? So on top of everything else going on in the lungs, the baby may also be suffering from some hypoxic ischemic damage or some respiratory failure just from not having gotten enough oxygen to the body. All these seven mechanisms together can result in very severe pulmonary hypertension. So go and look at the pulmonary hypertension lecture, one of the videos, and just know that meconium aspiration syndrome is actually one of the most common reasons of persistent pulmonary hypertension. So how do you prevent meconium aspiration syndrome? It has been shown that preventing post-term births, so babies delivering at 42 and 43 weeks, has really dropped the rate of meconium aspiration syndrome. Also, just constantly monitoring the mothers, having external monitoring of the mothers. So if the babies do start having D cells or start looking like they're stressed out on the monitor, then sooner rather than later, those babies would be taken for C-section rather than having had the opportunity to pass the meconium and then start inhaling it for long enough to cause the damage. What the medical community is less sure about is how to treat babies that have been born through meconium stained amniotic fluid. Up until about 20 years ago, what everybody did was as soon as the baby was born, even if they were vigorous or, or not vigorous, the baby would immediately be intubated and then suctioned. The trachea would be suctioned through the endotracheal tubes. And older neonatologists talk about how before the meconium aspirator was invented, they used to literally suck on the tube itself to get out the meconium or some weird contraption to actually get out the meconium. Then everybody kind of realized that we were intubating a lot of babies that really didn't need intubation. And also that a lot of the damage from the meconium had already happened several hours before. So suctioning out a bit of meconium from the trachea probably wasn't gonna make a big difference. So then the NRP recommended that only babies that were born through meconium stained amniotic fluid that were not vigorous should be intubated and suctioned. Then in 2015, so about six years ago, the NRP came out and said that even non-vigorous babies born through amniotic fluid should not be immediately intubated and suctioned, and we should just kind of go down the routine NRP guidelines. Not everybody is completely convinced by this, and a paper has shown that maybe babies that weren't treated as aggressively ended up needing more support in the NICU. 
I think what everybody can take from this is if a baby is born through meconium stained amniotic fluid, then your threshold to do something about it, intubate and suction, should probably be a lot lower than a baby not born through meconium stained amniotic fluid. So what about x-ray findings of meconium aspiration syndrome? Really what you end up seeing is something that looks pretty pathognomonic. Like very often we can look at that x-ray and be like, that's definitely meconium aspiration syndrome. The lungs are normally pretty well expanded and that could be a bit to do with hyperinflation, a bit to do with the support that they're on. And then there are areas of atelectasis, again, areas of collapsed alveoli, which we said was probably from particulate matter, just blocking everything off again, areas of hyperinflation, and then you just see these patchy areas everywhere that are just consistent with bits of meconium actually in the lungs. Obviously, you might also see an air leak, so a pneumomediastinum or a pneumothorax. Now let's talk about treatment. Again, please refer to the video on persistent pulmonary hypertension. I kind of go over the treatment there a lot. Ultimately, like a lot of diseases in the NICU, you need to give supportive care. So give babies the oxygen that they need and the respiratory support they need, whether that's conventional or the oscillator as a form of ventilation. Because of surfactant inactivation, sometimes these babies can benefit by being given surfactant. Remember though, these are full-term babies. So if you have like a four kilo kid and you wanna give three mLs of surfactant per kilo, that's 12 mLs of fluid that you're pouring down the trachea and into the lungs. And in a borderline baby, that might be just enough to put them over the edge. So do it very gently and very carefully and very slowly. Obviously, if a baby has a pneumothorax, then you have to needle it or place a chest tube. If there's any risk at all about the baby having an infection, then obviously you have to start antibiotics. Also, because the pneumonitis or like the chemical inflammation, the irritation of the lungs can be such a huge problem in babies with meconium aspiration syndrome, very often steroids can have a really good effect on these babies. And we definitely had a lot of babies in the NICU that were borderline needing ECMO and much higher higher support was started on steroids and immediately started improving. This is because of the chemical pneumonitis that they're having. And then obviously if the pulmonary hypertension is a big component and the way that you would diagnose that is with an echo, again go back and look at the video, then you would give all the support that you would need in that situation. So oxygen, maybe inhaled nitric oxide, which has done wonders in decreasing the need for ECMO and meconium aspiration syndrome, as well as inotropic support, sedation, anything else that the baby could benefit from. Because of the decreased number of post-term births, as well as the overall better management of infants with meconium aspiration syndrome, so especially the inhaled nitric oxide, that really made a huge difference. Babies with meconium aspiration syndrome are not getting as sick, they're not needing ECMO as often, not nearly as often, and the mortality rate has also fallen. So altogether, we're moving in the right direction with meconium aspiration syndrome. I hope you learned something today. Please remember to like and subscribe and comment below about any future topics you'd like me to chat about. Thank you.